Thank you so much, David. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be back on this campus where I started uh, and studied as an undergraduate not long after Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. was asked to think about what the place should look like. Um, contemplate plans and planners of whatever ilk or type, and at least some of the consideration has to be on what might have been. Such is the truism of landscape plans and planners, perhaps no more so than with the case and career of Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. across time and place in the 20th century American West. <laughs> Consider two cases, both from Southern California, one well-known and one obscure, but both instructive. First, the well-known, or at least not terribly obscure. Reflect first on the Los Angeles imagined by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. More specifically, imagine and think about the plan that Olmsted Brothers and its collaborator, Harlan Bartholomew and Associates of St. Louis, produced for their client, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, in the late 1920s, a topic which several of us will take up more fully this afternoon. Years of ground level survey analysis and painstaking design came together and culminated in a proposal for a brilliantly articulated system of neighborhood parks, playgrounds, and other greenbelt spaces. LinkedIn turned to regional reservations along the coast and interspersed across and through surrounding foothills, mountains, and deserts. This was a daring vision, couched though it was in sober language, fairly bland photography, and careful, meticulous renderings and sketches. Reimagined space stretched to a vast area of more than 1,500 square miles, reaching from the Antelope Valley in the north to the harbor complex in San Pedro and Long Beach, from the beaches in Malibu east 100 miles to Riverside County. Had it been brought to fruition, the Olmsted plan would have drawn 70,000 acres of mostly new parkland into an interconnected system of regional green space. This was the product of a collaborative, expensive, and long exercise. It was also singularly and profoundly indebted to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Since then, aside from easel reveries of charrette workshops and the merely wishful sketches of an impossible landscape future. There has been nothing like the Olmsted plan in Southern California. 80 years hence, the plan is at once a lofty commemoration of inspiration and a wistful and nearly funerary keepsake, a memento mori of landscape regret. Though complex in its intricacy and detail, the landscape narrative of the work can quickly be conveyed. As greater Los Angeles grew through the first decades of the 20th century, expanding outward in bold metropolitan ambition, civic awareness of a lack of environmental planning from both public and private sectors grew as well. Urban and suburban expansion in the Los Angeles basin occurred swiftly, well ahead of any widespread awareness of planning deficits, but a few voices were raised about the need to think more broadly about how Los Angeles should grow. By the mid-1920s, disparate opinions had coalesced into a movement of sorts, or at least it had developed momentum, backed by private subscriptions from wealthy patrons. A committee spun from the Chamber of Commerce made a pitch to the Olmsted Brothers firm, though it was now reduced to a single brother, to come west to design and plan an expressly articulated landscape future for the City of Angels. Having haughtily rebuffed earlier entities, which began with late 19th century appeals to Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. himself, the firm accepted the job in the late 20s. Several years of on-site planning ensued, with Olmsted Jr. presiding over a talented collection of landscape engineering and planning professionals. By then, the most experienced design team in the nation, the firm matched visionary landscapes with the hard-headed financial and political acumen needed to make things happen beyond inspirations formed atop the drafting table. Crammed as it was into fewer than 200 pages, and this is it, parks, playgrounds, and beaches for the Los Angeles region presented three essential routes toward a very, very different Los Angeles moving into the future from the earliest years of the Great Depression. First, the plan linked open space sites and green belts in a design that could be described as laying a gigantic emerald necklace across much of Southern California. Second, Olmsted Jr. and his partners laid out the fiscal trails that would bring great sums of public, private, and bonded funds together. Third, the planners reminded their client that big plans necessitated big governance. 
the report sketched out a super jurisdictional political entity that could effectively manage a comprehensive landscape vision brought to life over hundreds and hundreds of square miles. From the vantage of nearly a century later, it all looks so straightforward, even dry in its clarity and precision. Yet visionary planning is meant only for a shelf, or at best a wall, if it cannot be implemented and once executed, cared for. It was precisely that expectation of caring for in the plan that tripped it up, fatally. The downfall was swift and dramatic. The Olmsted plan was supposed to be printed in copies enough so its distribution could be far and wide and to many and disparate audiences. But the plan was printed in less than 200 copies. And thus handbook or blueprint or manual became instead instant rare book. Why? Having done so much so well, the planners made a crucial error, though it probably caught them unawares. Olmsted Jr. misread the eventual reaction of his client though not as to the plan, its scale, or even what it would cost. As it turned out, the Chamber of Commerce, and especially its executive committee, resented the idea that a new institutional body would be created to run the greened system brought to fruition by the plan. Though Olmsted was shrewd and correct in proposing that a super-jurisdictional committee oversee a super-jurisdictional plan, the Chamber of Commerce proved adamant in its unwillingness to cede authority to an upstart group created of whole cloth. That prospect was, to quote one prominent chamber member, nothing less than terrifying. What had been launched from a clever set of ambitions and opportune moments and had been carried forward by a recognition of deficits in articulated greenbelt green spaces and access ended in smoke-filled rooms, victimized by pettiness with grand-scale consequences and legitimated by defensive, but no less ignorant for their defensiveness, pronouncements which literally claimed that Los Angeles had plenty of parks. Had chamber leaders objected to public expenditures on a big scale or to what might be considered centralized planning, though with significant private sector inputs of expertise and capital, we might characterize the opposition as politically motivated. But the antagonism was more peevish than principled. Lacking any animating reception whatsoever, the report languished and then disappeared. The irony is almost as palpable as the misfortune. At the dawn of the Great Depression, which would usher in a period in which federal dollars and federal authority would forever alter the political and economic landscape of Southern California, the Chamber of Commerce held on to an antiquated past and an outmoded constellation and consolidation of municipal power. That stubbornness profoundly jeopardized the future. Those very landscapes of monetary, and, uh, monetary uh, trails and governance, as well as to be sure the diverse riparian and terrestrial uh, landscapes of greater Los Angeles. The shame of it is nearly drowned out amidst a cascade of lost opportunities. They got so much right in planning, and it pays to note in prophecy. From his late 1920s visit, Vista, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. forecast the demographic expansion of Southern California down to 1950 with uncanny accuracy, despite no inkling of wartime population growth. But all that was right was met by a response so wrong. Peevish isn't even quite the right analytic. Spiteful is closer. Tired metaphors or cliches notwithstanding, this is a lost landscape. A landscape not just tinged, but saturated with regret. This pre-war era in Southern California is forever marked and demarcated by the default planning influences of land, water, electricity, and transit bar baron Henry Huntington. His is a profound impact, present very much unto today and it would have changed greater Los Angeles forever had the professional and practice planning ethos and expertise of Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. been allowed to mix and mingle and revise the heavy Huntington footprint on our Southern California landscape. That's case study one. Now to the obscure, which takes us also to Brookline and Southern California, to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and to Los Angeles, and to years before the great failure of 1930. In 1919, William Wrigley Jr., a man with a new occupational title in American history, that of chewing gum industrialist, bought a controlling interest in Santa Catalina Island, part of the beautiful Channel Islands archipelago off the Southern California coast, a few dozen miles out into the Pacific. Wanting to do something big, Wrigley considered contact, contact in the Olmsted brothers to ask them to dust off a nearly two decades old plan for resort planning at the narrow isthmus, 
towards the northwestern end of the island. If realized, the plan and the vision and the ambition would, in the words of one prominent Wrigley advisor, quote, be bigger than Atlantic City. The lineage of that misbegotten idea stretched back nearly 30 years before parks, playgrounds, and beaches, back to 1903, the very year Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. passes from the scene. And it stretches to the previous pre-Wrigley owners of Catalina. This was the Banning family, a clan that had made their money in trade and transit rising out of the harbor districts of Wilmington and San Pedro. Before selling their island to the chewing gum magnate, the Banning sponsored their own Olmstedian vision for that quiet isthmus landscape lying on the northern portion of the island. There, atop a local population numbering only in the dozens, the Bannings thought they too saw a big tourist future, if, in not, if not in Atlantic City terms, at least with something far beyond island rustic. As was the fashion, they planted lots of eucalyptus trees. They laid in water and sewer systems. They envisioned hotels. Dollar figures began to be tossed around in the early years of the 20th century. The Bannings might develop the isthmus and its two harbors with a cash outlay of a million dollars. That's a million 1903 dollars. The Bannings went to Brookline, and they asked if Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., John Olmsted, and the Olmsted brothers could bring the firm, could bring their vision to fruition. Could the Olmsteads line new Catalina boulevards with trees? Could they landscape the two harbors area on either side of the thin isthmus and connect it to other Banning ideas and investments elsewhere on the island? In a somewhat surprising move, Frederick Olmsted Jr. sent two planners out. And by the summer of 1903, John Olmsted, FLO Jr.'s cousin and stepbrother at once, had produced an elaborate plan laid out in rich detail across dozens of pages. And he did this at the very same time he was working so elaborately and so successfully on Seattle's open spaces and parks. Recall John Olmsted's fabulous 1903 springtime congratulatory statement about Seattle's success at acquiring public parcels of land ahead of private development. As he said to the Seattleites, quote, you have taken time by the forelock and purchased parks when the city was young. Well to the south of Seattle and out into the ocean, on tiny and so privately held Catalina, John and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. saw a future with three hotels at least, one grand, one grander, one grandest, to be built. Decorative native plantings and spe special, specially crafted guardrails would fan out alongside and from new roads, roads presumably to be trafficked not by cars, but by horse-drawn vehicles. The Bannings, after all, had made part of most of their money out of stagecoach routes and carriages to begin with. A new elaborate and big seawater swimming pool would be surrounded by cottages thickly dispersed so as to make a tourist village. Other tourist amenities were to be constructed in Olmsted's plan. Restaurants, other re recreational sites and distractions. Maybe this would be a little or not so little Atlantic City or the roots of what would grow into something bigger over time. This 1903 vision was after all the very seed of the Olmsted report that William Wrigley nearly dusted off and planted in the Catalina soil and water so to make something very big indeed around 1920. But like the Wrigley vision, the Banning Olmsted plans were shelved. A storm leveled most of the new trees and mud caked what few roads had been laid out or were already there. The million dollars never materialized or was put to other uses off the island, and the island itself was soon sold. Two Olmstedian moments, two Frederick Law Jr. Olmstedian moments. Big plans, Southern California clients, and Southern California landscapes. Neither materialized. Regret and loss envelopes the one, something different characterizes the latter. Admittedly, it's a subjective judgment, but it's a good thing Catalina Island never became, quote, America's favorite playground, as its Jersey Shore would-be counterpart is built. A nature and scientific preserve today with tourist amenities, albeit on a small scale, Catalina Island is hardly an Atlantic city on the Pacific. It is governed and overseen today for the most part by a preservation-minded and experienced entity the Santa Catalina Island Conservancy. And it helps make and shore up the commitment to conservation and restoration stretching across the archipelago's many channel islands. As we launch today's full consideration of the planner and the region, 
let me offer a few additional framing of devices or thoughts which might help animate all that we are about to learn across our day spent together. These thoughts spring from my experience in thinking about Olmsted Jr. in the Los Angeles context in particular, but also from a lesser familiarity with his and his firm's footprint in plans realized and in plans shelved across the entire American West. I offer these two case studies as background and backdrop, but also because considering them offers us all a chance to raise some questions about how we view Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and Olmsted Brothers across the wide spaces of the West. Not all their plans came to pass. Not all their plans ought to have come to pass. Some unrealized plans were missed opportunities. Some unrealized plans were opportunities actually gained. Some lost plans deserve to be dusted, and some don't. There's intricacies abundant in here, which I'll visit a little bit more in a few minutes, intricacies which historical sensitivity and historical research can help elucidate. We gather together here this morning because Olmsted Brothers, and we need to remember that John dies in 1920. He's nearly a generation older than his cousin brother, Frederick. Olmsted Brothers had a lasting effect on myriad landscapes across the West, through urban and metropolitan planning, through individual park parcels, through estates and elite subdivisions, and through ideas shaping entities such as the national parks and the California state park system. Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. remains the dominant figure in the room. We're going to hear a lot about him today, too. But the influence of the sons is nonetheless profound, and even more so if we cast that influence regionally. Olmsted brothers worked in the east, and Olmsted Sr. worked in the west, obviously right here. But the regional and the western cast to the work of the sons is special. It's not useful to pit Olmsted Brothers against Olmsted Patriarch in an influence contest. It is useful to continue to study the Olmsted legacy after 1903 and to mark its exceedingly important consequences and ramifications. And we cannot but include and even feature the West in that consideration. In commemoration of all that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. accomplished, and the same goes for his kin, we find connoisseurship. The National Association for the Olmsted Parks is at least partially thus and I think appropriately so, oriented. Connoisseurship, when it makes of Olmsted projects perfect gems and jewels, could lean a bit towards encapsulating landscapes in the context only of their origin. And that can lead to holding these places fast in time and a forgetfulness of the sheer temporal genius of someone like Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. I'm still amazed at his projections for Los Angeles' growth at just the moment when growth stalled because of the Depression. And as a Coloradan, who yet spends a fair amount of time in the Colorado Rockies, I'm struck by the Olmstedian evergreen buffer system at the western rising end of Denver. It's a bit of a weird landscape in some ways, mostly because of the presence of a seemingly confused small bison herd amidst the pine cones and the conifers. But it's a remarkable preserve, too, an articulated landscape of mountain parks and spaces guiding people into the Rockies from the Denver flatlands and banding a big area as free from Denver's encroachment. Connoisseurship is obviously a good impulse for preservation, but we want to allow the temporal dimensions to have some room here. We should want to understand how Olmsted saw Denver pressing against the front range across the decades, and we should be just as attuned to how that mountain park preserve may work or operate differently today than it did during Olmsted's time. In other words, connoisseurship shouldn't result in bottling Olmsted landscapes up as untouchable, and it runs aground a bit, I think, when context is lost or we, when we neglect to examine just why plans succeeded or failed or when we assume a failed Olmsted plan, I think Catalina, was by definition an event to be categorized as loss. Parenthetically, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. hardly ever lingered on failures or obstacles. There was too much work to do, too much west and elsewhere, and he comes through the historic record as ever the realist. Clients balked, money didn't come through, or money ran out. Circumstances changed, Olmsted moved on to the next project. Another frame we ought to think about, and today we will, is one where elite landscape work for one-off wealthy clients, behind gates, hedgerows, or French LA's, blends and bleeds with more complex Olmstedian obligations to noblesse oblige, and where that impulse, in turn, becomes something arrestingly democratic. They're all there in the life of the father and the sons. For every high-end elite project, Biltmore, for example, or more apt for today, 
The oligarchic financier Frank Vanderlip's half-started Italian hill village concept on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, which looks right to Catalina, so close it seems as if you can touch it. There's something broader, always something beyond the sanctifying preserves of the uber-wealthy. Think here of parks, playgrounds, and beaches and bemoan the loss of such broad and open access to trails, paths, parks, beaches, and deserts. Some of that's coming back in Southern California, but it's piecemeal. As a now Californian, how can I not be grateful and respectful of Olmstead and the state park system, of Olmstead and the East Bay Regional Park District and system, every bit as ambitious as parks, playgrounds, and beaches in Southern California, and a success story coming on the very heels of the killed off reimagining of most of Southern California. Or think of the simple demographic, demogra democratic obligation Olmstead Jr. offered to the founding spirit of the national park. Parks, begun in some important fashion by Olmsted Sr.'s brilliant recognition that post-Civil War America would need landscapes of convalescence. And here he was thinking exactly of Yosemite. The national park movement and moment is in the early 20th century deeply indebted to the sun, who observed the park, system, system, park service mission simply and equitably as, quote, to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. There's much, much more to learn about individual plans, about the well over a thousand plans that make up the Olmsted brothers' corpus, about what makes them generalizable and what makes them different. It makes all the sense in the world to pull FLO Jr. into the light and ask about his influence. We need to keep an eye on his brother, cousin, too, and always an eye upon their father a lineage that epitomizes and plays a pivotal role in revolutionary national landscape change, to say the least. When Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. was born in 1822, the United States had 24 states. Every one of the presidents of the young nation at his birth came from Virginia. When Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. died, the United States had exactly double the number of states, 48. From eras of manifest to metropolitan destiny, the Olmsted imprint is palpable in the intellectual, cultural, and environmental landscapes of this nation. Let me flesh this last bit out just a bit. Two decades ago, Richard White, historian now of this campus and one of the preeminent American historians currently at work, brilliantly paired two Americans forever identified with the West and with waking, making the West American. In an essay which accompanied an important exhibit, White placed the historian Frederick Jackson Turner alongside Buffalo Bill and interrogated their coincidental late 19th and early 20th century visions of the American West and of the West landscapes. It remains a powerful essay which I recommend to you, contrasting, for example, Turner's negation of indigenous people of the West to Buffalo Bill's fundamental need for Indian contact and clash to become what he became in fame and wealth. Let me borrow that pairing idea as we move forward to our conference. Frederick Jackson Turner, and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. were contemporaries, tied together by era, by time at Harvard, by an incommon eventual death in Southern California, and by visions of the American future deeply enmeshed with the fate and future of the landscapes of the American West. Recall the famed Turner thesis, first delivered at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, a place and spectacle deeply Olmsteaded. Olmsteaded. Turner's thesis, thesis offered a grand unifying theory of American history and American democracy. Turner's summation of the previous centuries of American experience from even before the Republic forward was this. The process of Westering, inexorable movement across the landscapes of North America, incumbent as they were upon the conquest of the land itself, was the stuff of democracy. Taming, as he would have put it, the land, subduing it, farming it, and building atop those farms the institutions of society, governance, faith, education, and the like, were as little engines of democratic replenishment. Going West, tackling the West, made of the, uh, making of the West American, that is what not just made America great in Turner's eyes, it is precisely what made America. Democracy and democratic institutions enjoyed constant and regular reinvigoration as successive undulating waves of American settlers and their institutions took up the main chance in this or that newly subdued Western space, township, county, town, or village. It's an elegant equation, and it tapped into much of American lore and history. On the one hand, the assumptions are celebratory. Westering Americans made the nation proud. 
the prosaic institution building of small town builders at Frontier's Edge carried democracy forward in Turner's vision, fueled it even. With axe and gavel, with Bible and firearm, the stalwarts of the West, men and women like, alike, honored the legacies of the founding fathers and built and sustained what they first had formed in the documentary abstract. But that celebratory impulse is but the penultimate assumption in Turner's thesis. What lurks within it is a darker vision, or at least a vision far less certain. For Turner, certainty lay in two observable, observable phenomena. One, Western Americans made of their frontier experiences the very stuff of democracy. And two, that chapter, that long chapter of American history, he said, had closed. When Turner stood at the podium in 1893, he noted that the recent 1890 census could no longer find a longitudinal unbroken line of frontier on the United States portion of the continent. There was no longer a clean and clear demarcation north to south that on its western side could be labeled frontier by way of population density, or actually its opposite. That once unbroken line had become dotted, broken up by settlement, and in Turner's eyes, civilization. Uh-oh. If that frontier wasn't there, Turner called it a safety valve to relieve the pressures of undemocratic impulses or settings back east. If it wasn't there, how could American democracy be now replenished as the 20th century beckoned? That he did not know. What he did know was that in his words, the first period in American history had closed. A question mark looms over that idea. What now? Enter his contemporary, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. There's a metaphorical torch passed here, I think. For it's Olmsted Jr., though of course and decidedly not alone, but important nonetheless, who picks up this thread in a lifetime's work. If Americans weren't to go to the frontier any longer, where were they going? To the cities, of course. They and legions of others newly arrived to either shore and every place in between. And if the frontier couldn't sustain or invigorate or replenish democracy any longer, the era wondered and wished, could cities do it? Hadn't they must? At the heart of the progressive era is a fervent wish that cities could indeed become and must become their own engines of democracy. They must do, alchemically it's hard to figure out exactly how, but they must do the work that had previously, as the theory went, been shouldered by the frontier experience. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. had a plan, a lifelong plan. He knew that nature remained at the heart of the equation, though it was a nature now less in need of Tenarian taming than in rationalization and improvements in efficiency. But the democracy piece is every bit as much there as it was in Turner's ideas. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. at his best, and most often in the West, saw in the urban landscapes and their adjacent hinterlands, Denver's perfect in this way, ways in which de democratic access to the recreative, rejuvenative, convalescent, and restorative places and parcels of nature, cultivated and not, sculpted, sculpted and not, could do egalitarian work. The big park and open space plans, the Denver's and Seattle's and East Bay's and Los Angeles's, melded metropolitan growth with visions of egalitarian access to natural amenities, to constructural space, constructed spaces, to water and travel and vistas and breathing space. Axes and the exertion required of conquest had mutated to far more recreative landscapes. Manifest destiny's physicality had become metropolitan's destiny's repose. Or if not quite repose, at least something less taxing, more urban, and more 20th century as a counterpart to the blood and sweat of dominion. But make no mistake, there remains in there a deep intertwined attachment to nature and democracy and how the constructive relationship between the two in new urban and metropolitan landscapes could provide salvation for both, for both nature and democracy. That's Frederick Law uh, Olmsted Jr. at his very best. And I think that's an important place for us to begin today's further investigations, today's ideas, and today's perspectives. Thank you very much.